In this video, I'd like to talk a little bit about fuses, and in particular, we'll be looking at these small cartridge fuses that you often find in small circuits. And these are different from automotive fuses, and I'm not going to be talking about automotive fuses in this particular video. Fuses are almost always used in order to protect a circuit from fires and to protect it from faults, like short circuits. We're in Singapore right now, and I think that something very interesting about the plugs here is that they often come with fuses installed right into the plug. So for example, this is the cord for our oscilloscope and it has a fuse here that's rated 13 amperes, 250 volts. It doesn't mean that our oscilloscope uses 13 amperes of current, but it does mean that 13 amperes would probably not be a safe amount of current to flow through this particular cord. Fuses are always installed, by the way, on the high side of a circuit or the hot side. So in this plug, the fuse is installed with respect to the high side rather than from the ground. If a circuit has a fault condition, you want to make sure that the fuse will remove the hot connection from the rest of the circuit rather than remove the ground, which could be very dangerous. There are two common sizes for these small cartridge fuses. This one is 32 millimeters long. And the smaller one here is 20 millimeters long, and the 20 millimeter size is a little bit more common. I have here in front of me a few types of fuse holders. This is panel mount fuse socket. This is typically mounted on the front of a panel. You can access the connections to the fuse from the back, and then a user that might want to change the fuse can change it from the front and slot it in. This is called a fuse block. It just has a single hole in the center, so it's not too difficult to screw this down to the interior of an enclosure. A fuse can then easily be snapped into place. This is a fuse socket that's meant for use on a printed circuit board, so these leads would be soldered down to a circuit board, and again, a fuse can easily be snapped into place. I have two different types of fuses that I would like to do some experiment with here at the bench, a fast acting fuse and a slow blow fuse. Let me first describe the differences between a fast acting fuse and a slow blow fuse, and I'll describe everything that you need to know in order to choose a fuse for your circuit. What are all the considerations that someone needs to make when they choose a fuse? After we choose our fuses, we'll come back over here and do some experiments with them. Let's first take a look at this 217 series cartridge fuse from a company called Little Fuse. It's a fast acting 32 milliamp fuse. And as you can see by the fact that I've called it a 32 milliamp fuse, it's the current that's the most important parameter when selecting fuse. You could think about this 32 milliamp as the current at which the fuse is going to blow out. Now that's not exactly the full story, but it's the most important thing to think about. This is what the data sheet for that particular fuse looks like. And like a lot of data sheets, there are a lot of different fuses included on the same data sheet. So this particular fuse actually represents the top line here in the data sheet. We're going to look at the most important parameters from this data sheet in a little bit more detail. Of course, the ampere rating or the current rating of a fuse is the most important parameter of a fuse. If you pass more current than that through the fuse, it'll blow out. Now, like I said, that's not the full story but that's the most important part of the story. After a fuse blows out, you will typically have a very high voltage from one side of the fuse to the other. For example, if a fuse is used in a power supply or the power supply portion of a circuit, then a fault could cause a short circuit to show up across that fuse. After the fuse is blown though, you might have the full voltage of the power supply across the fuse. So you need to make sure that the voltage rating of your fuse exceeds whatever maximum voltage you might expect in your circuit. Here in Singapore, the municipal electricity grid operates at 230 volts AC. So typically any fuse with a voltage rating higher than that would be safe to use in the power supply portion of a circuit. Now, can you use a fuse that's rated at 1,000 volts, 32 milliamp, in a circuit where the voltage would only be 230 volts? Yes, you can. So as long as the voltage rating is higher than any voltage that you expect would appear across that fuse, then you're safe. The reason for having this voltage rating is to prevent the fuse from arcing after it's already blown out. Once a fuse blows out, you want it to stay blow. You don't want a little lightning bolt to run inside the fuse from the hot side to the low side. 
The next parameter here is the interrupting rating. That's the maximum expected short circuit current. Now that's different from the current rating of the fuse that causes it to blow. This particular fuse will melt when you pass about 32 milliamps through it. But when you have a problem in a circuit, you could temporarily, instantaneously have a much higher current that might flow. Of course, the fuse is going to melt and it's going to melt very quickly, but you don't want a situation where so much current is flowing through the fuse that the fuse can't handle as it's melting or as it's blowing up. You don't want the fuse to send shrapnel all over the place or to melt in such a way that it doesn't do its primary job, which is to break the current current flow. This fuse can handle 35 amperes at the moment it's blowing. Fuses have a certain amount of resistance, that's to be expected. The next parameter in the list here is the nominal melting I squared T. And you could think of this as describing how fast it takes for a fuse to melt. You might not want a fuse to melt too quickly because in a lot of circuits, especially those containing capacitors and inductors, there might be temporarily, instantaneously, larger amounts of current flow. For example, when a capacitor is being charged up when you first turn a circuit on. You don't want the fuse to blow, which would be a nuisance in such a situation. Now the reason why it has this unusual formula, I squared T, is because how long it takes a fuse to melt depends on the current. Now the power that a fuse dissipates is the same as that of a resistor. A fuse is really just a resistor, so power equals I squared times R. Now the energy required to melt the fuse, E, is going to be power times time. E equals I squared R times T. Now in a fuse, since it's basically just a resistor, the R is constant. So the energy required to melt a fuse is proportional to I squared times T. That's what this number tells us. A fuse with a larger I squared T number will take a longer time to melt. That's all it says. This is a fast blow fuse and this is a pretty small number here. The last parameter here is the maximum voltage drop at the rated current. This is basically the maximum voltage the fuse can handle before blowing rather than after. V equals IR and a fuse is a resistor, so if you take the current rating of the fuse, 32 milliamps, and you multiply it times its resistance, 262 ohms, you'll get 8.4 volts or so. Now that's different from this number, and the reason for this difference is that the fuse resistance depends a little bit on temperature. These curves represent the amount of time it takes the fuse to melt given a particular current for that series of fuses. So the particular fuse that I have here in front of me is the black line. You can see that if we have less current passing through the fuse, it takes a longer time for the fuse to blow out. Any current less than 32 milliamps will not cause the fuse to blow out regardless of the amount of time that's passed. Now this was the line from the fast blowing fuse or the fast acting fuse. What do these parameters look like for a slow blow fuse? So let's look at the parameters for the model 218 fuse from Little Fuse, which is also a 32 milliamp fuse. Both of these fuses have the same current rating, the same voltage rating, the same interrupting rating. They have a slight difference in resistance and a slight difference in the maximum voltage drop, but we're not going to worry about those. The key difference between these two fuses here is in the nominal melting I squared T. You'll notice that with the fast acting fuse, it was 0 0.00015, but with the slow blow fuse, it was 0 0.01, a much larger number. It means that it takes this slow blow fuse a longer period of time to melt when you have the same amount of current going through it as the fast acting fuse. We can compare these two curves. I've superimposed the curve from the slow blow fuse onto the same graph that the company used to describe their fast blowing fuse. Let's say hypothetically that I were to pass 80 milliamps through each of these fuses. You can see that the fast blowing fuse would take about 0.1 seconds to melt, whereas the slow blow fuse would take about 10 seconds to melt. So we're gonna start with the fast acting fuse and I have it wired up in a simple DC circuit. We have a DC power supply supplying a current that will pass through the fuse, through our ammeter, and then through a resistor. And the reason I have the resistor in the circuit is so that when I change the voltage here of the DC power supply, the current won't suddenly get too high. Let's go ahead and turn it on. I'm starting here at zero volts and we can monitor the current flowing through the fuse right here with our multimeter. We know that this particular fuse should be fairly safe up to about 35 milliamps, and then beyond that, it should blow fairly quickly. So right now we're at the rated current of the fuse. 
What I'm going to do is to increase the voltage suddenly in order to simulate a fault. Let's see if we can get the current up to about 80 milliamps before the fuse blows. So the fuse is blown, current has stopped flowing. It looked like I got it up to about 70 some milliamps and then the fuse blew very quickly. We now have 31 volts appearing across the fuse. That's why the voltage rating is important. Let's dial it down and try the slow blow fuse next. So first I'm going to turn the current up to 35 milliamps, which is the rated current for this slow blow fuse. The fuse hasn't blown out and that's exactly what we expect. By the way, when you actually use a fuse in a circuit, you shouldn't use a fuse that's rated right at the maximum amount of current that your circuit should use. You should probably choose a fuse that's a little bit higher than that in order to prevent nuisance blowing. Sometimes circuits can have power spikes, for example. Let's again do the same thing with this slow blow fuse that I did with the fast acting fuse. I'm going to quickly turn the voltage up such that the current becomes something like 80 milliamps and then we'll see how long it takes this slow blow fuse to blow out. The reason why the current level is dropping is because the resistance of the fuse depends a little bit on temperature and the fuse is now hotter than it was when I first started flowing current into it. It looks like the fuse just blew out. We can see that now there isn't any current going through this fuse. So I think this was a very clear demonstration of the difference between these two fuses. Although they were both rated at 35 milliamps, we saw that the slow blow fuse took quite a bit longer than the fast acting fuse to blow out. Let's go and look at a couple of example problems on fuse selection before we wrap up the video. Example one, which fuse is the best for a 1.5 kilowatt device operating at 230 volts? Well, if I take 1500 watts and divide it by 230 volts, I'm going to get 6.52 amperes. A is wrong, but how about B, C, and D? If our device is only going to use 6.52 amperes, can I pick B? Well, no, because our device is operating at 230 volts. So the correct answer in this problem is C, 9 amperes at 250 volts. It's always a good idea to pick a current rating for the fuse that's a little bit higher than the maximum expected current draw of a circuit to prevent nuisance blowing. I recommend dividing the current by 0.75 in order to find a fuse rating current. So since this device uses typically 6.52 amperes of current, I can take 6.52 divided by 0.75, giving us 8.7 amperes. C, again, is the correct answer, because 9 amperes should be a sufficient rating to prevent nuisance blowing, and 250 volts is higher than 230 volts. Example 2, which fuse is the best if a circuit might draw 15 milliamps most of the time and 30 milliamps momentarily when first switched on? Well, A is wrong. The fuse would blow out right away. B is wrong because it'll blow out after a few minutes of use. C would probably work just fine. This circuit is only going to be using 15 milliamps most of the time. So if I take 15 and divide it by 0.75, I get 20 milliamps. This means that a 20 milliamp fuse would typically be suitable for this circuit. A 25 milliamp slow blow fuse would certainly work too. If the circuit only draws 30 milliamps for a short period of time when you're first switching it on, the slow blow fuse won't have enough time to blow. This is exactly why sometimes slow blow fuses are used. C is the correct answer. This video is part of an organized sequence where I explore various AC and switching circuits. If you enjoyed it, then you might consider following the channel's playlist to learn more about these types of circuits.